Okay. Thank you for the introduction. Um, I also want to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity, opportunity to uh, present our work. Uh, today, I will talk about scalable surface code decoders with parallelization in time. Uh, this is a joint work with Xin Yutan, Fang Zhang, uh, Yao Yunshi, and uh, Jian Xinchen. Uh, this is the archive number of our paper. Uh, Xin Yutan was a research intern with Damo Quantum Lab last summer, and now she is a PhD student at MIT. All the other authors are from Damo Quantum Lab. Um, I have to mention that uh, uh, our lab is a funding lab of Damo Quantum uh, Damo Adap Ad Academy, and it's a, a global research institute of Alibaba Group. Okay, so our paper is about uh, the error correction for the surface code. Uh, but for this talk, uh, I really want to motivate from a very broad perspective. Uh, we want to understand the role of classical processing for quantum fault tolerance. Uh, a natural and fundamental question is that, is classical processing necessary for fault tolerance? Well, this, que uh, this question is answered in one of the first papers about threshold theorem. Uh, in this seminal paper by Aronoff and Bernard, they show that um, if you do not use any mid-circuit measurement or classical operation, you can still achieve fault tolerance. Uh, that is, uh, you can still efficiently simulate any ideal circuit using a noisy circuit provided the noise is below a certain threshold. So in theory, this set result is quite reassuring because uh, it means uh, you know, quantum model is complete in the sense that it, it can be made uh, to be fault tolerant within itself, without the need of classical processing. However, in practice, we need practical fault tolerance. Uh, by practical, I mean we need a large threshold value, not just a positive. And we, we also want the space-time overhead to be uh, as small as possible, not just a polynomial or polylog. So for this purpose, um, it is crucial to use classical processing to um, optimize or improve our fault tolerance schemes. Um, I don't think it's possible to give a clear-cut and exhaustive classification of classical processing. So here, I just list a few different flavors of classical processing. Uh, for example, uh, post-selection is based on error detection and uh, has been used in the you know, error pr uh, ancillary verification procedure uh, in Schwarz method of error correction. Uh, also, uh, magic state desolation also involves a lot of process selection. Um, physical level feed forward is more general and ubiquitous. Uh, for example, uh, for many uh, error correction schemes, you can adaptively determine uh, your subsequent synd syndrome extraction circuit based on the syndrome that you measure. And uh, here, by decoding, I mean uh, the non-adaptive part of error correction. Um, for example, we know the mean weight perfect matching decoder and the union fan decoder for the surface code. These decoders will output poly operators as correction, but you never have to physically apply this poly correction. Uh, so such decoding um, does not involve process selection or any <coughs> physical level feed forward. Um, I also want to uh, emphasize that in general, uh, error question protocol can involve all these three flavors of classical processing. And uh, we also have logical level feed forward. Uh, a notable example is a gate teleportation. For example, uh, you can implement a logical non-cleaver non gate using a logical magic state and uh, logical cleaver operations. And uh, certain logical cleaver operation will depend on the outcome of logical poly measurement in the past. In other words, uh, the outcome of logical measurement in the past will determine the behavior of uh, logical operations in the future. So this is a feed forward in the logical level rather than uh, in the physical level. Uh, in our paper and also in this talk, uh, I, will talk uh, I will focus on the relation bet between this logical level feed forward and error correction, especially this non-adaptive decoding part of error correction. And uh, uh, specifically, the dependency between error correction and uh, 
uh, logical level feed forward will give rise to the so-called backlog issue. Uh, this is first formulated in Terhol's review paper like 10 years ago. And this backlog issue is a central problem uh, we try to solve. So next, um, I will spend some time to explain this in detail. Uh, let's uh, first look, look at this uh, gate teleportation gadget that implements uh, a logical T gate using a logical magic state, a T state. So here we have a, a data block in the uh, logical process state, and we have an ancillary uh, block in a T state. And then we perform a logical C naught, and uh, uh, then we measure uh, the ancillary in the logical Z basis. Uh, without any error, the out, uh, this outcome is uniformly at random. If it's trivial, we do nothing. Um, if it's non-trivial, we perform a, a logical phase gate correction. And he here we can see that this is a logical feed forward because this outcome of logical measurement determines this logical uh, Clifford. Uh, but um, it seems that this feed forward is not necessary because you know this operation is a Clifford gate. And similar to polyframe, uh, uh, we don't have to actually perform this gate. We can, you know, classically keep track of this as a logical Clifford frame. So the point is that if this adaptivity can be made to be purely classical, then um, we don't actually need a fit forward. However, things are different if we look at this logical THT state, uh, circuit. So we have two gadgets, and in the middle we perform a logical Hadamard gate. And now we have these uh, three consecutive uh, clear for gates. Face gate, which is probabilistic, and uh, Hadamard gate, and uh, logical C0. And here is an equivalent circuit. Uh, we, you can see that we can proceed with this second magic state without knowing the outcome of the first Z measurement. And in the meantime, we can classically track the three Cliffords as a Clifford frame, logical U. Uh, and later, once we know the outcome B, uh, which is a binary, uh, we can update the Clifford frame or determine the value of U. But the catch is that uh, we cannot carry this um, Clifford frame beyond this second Z measurement. Because in this equ equivalent circuit, uh, the adaptive uh, Clifford frame U will become this uh, adaptive measurement. And this basis P will depend on the random value of B. So for this three uh, equivalent circuits, the upshot is that whichever circuit you use, um, the, your second gadgets, uh, you have to uh, depend on the random outcome from your first gadget. Uh, otherwise, um, if you do not use, uh, if you do not do this feed forward, uh, if you finish uh, the second gadget without knowing the outcome of the first gadget, then you will implement a single T gate rather than two. Uh, it's probably one half. So now let's look at this. Uh, uh, Let's consider the feed forward in this more general uh, circuit that implements a logical th to the power of n. So now uh, b1 is the outcome uh, of this logical p1 measurement. And if you determine the basis of uh, p2, and its outcome b2 uh, will then determine the basis of p3, and so on and so forth. Uh, remember that we need fault tolerance, so uh, we need to constantly perform error correction. Also, this, uh, these outcomes, they have to be error corrected. Uh, specifically, to, uh, in order to determine outcome BI, we have to receive all the syndromes before and during logical PI is measured. Uh, and the syndromes go through certain classical processing, say, uh, decoding. Uh, for example, in this circuit, uh, the outcome B2 dep uh, depends on the syndromes generated uh, within this interval of circuit. Um, you know, uh, before and during this P2 experiment, uh, experiment is measured. 
uh, also it's uh, useful to consider this uh, two, uh, two speeds, one classical speed and one quantum speed. So R pro uh, denotes the number of syndromes that can be classically processed per second. And R gen uh, denotes the number of uh, uh, syndromes that, uh, that are generated from uh, the quantum circuit per second. Uh, in practice, you know, these speeds cannot be invariant throughout the circuit. So uh, here, uh, they are just uh, uh, average over a span of time. We can further define Ti to be the moment when the outcome Bi is determined. And once Bi is known, we can start to measure the next poly uh, Pi plus one. For example, say the, start, uh, the, the, uh, the whole circuit start at time equal to zero, and later when B1 is determined at time T, T1, uh, we can start to measure logical P2. And later when B2 is determined at time T2, we can start to measure logical P3, and so on. Uh, the observation is that here, uh, the amount of these syndromes uh, is uh, lower bounded by R pro times T1. Uh, this is simply because, you know, the length of this interval is no less than T1. And uh, on the other hand, this R pro uh, times T2 equals the amount of syndromes that you have processed until time T2 when you can determine outcome B2. And uh, by definition, this is lower bounded by the, you know, the syndromes that are required. So this inequality between T1 and uh, T2 uh, straightforwardly uh, generalized to, you know, Ti minus one and the Ti. So this inequality. And from this, uh, you can, uh, it follows that uh, if R pro is smaller than uh, R gen, then Ti grows exponentially with, TI, uh, with I. In other words, uh, if the speed of syndrome processing is slower than the speed of syndrome generation, then the space-time overhead of fault tolerance will be exponential of the size of the computation uh, rather than polynomial. Uh, this issue of exponential backlog is first formulated in Turho's review paper. And I want to mention that uh, um, it also exists for other teleportation-based protocol. Uh, for example, uh, an alternative gadget to implement logical non clifford gates is uh, autocorrected teleportation proposed by Fowler and uh, later with Gini. And here is an uh, example gadget uh, in the recent paper by Litinsky and Nickerson about active volume. So we first measure uh, logical ZZ, whose outcome is a uh, binary B, uh, then if you determine the basis P, which is either X or Y. And this second measurement outcome, if it's non-trivial, then we perform this logical Z correction. And if uh, we use this gadget to implement logical TH to the power of N, uh, you will have a similar fit forward. For example, uh, the basis of P2 uh, it's de de determined, uh, depends on the XR of B2 plus A1. Uh, here, B2 is the outcome of this XZ measurement. And the A1 is the outcome of this uh, logical P1 measurement, and so on and so forth. Uh, then you can similarly uh, define TI and uh, do the same back of envelope calculation and arrive this uh, uh, and get this same condition for exponential backlog. Uh, it seems that this backlog issue is general and uh, exists for any universality approach based on teleportation. Uh, here by teleportation, I mean to implement a logical non clifford gates using logical magic states and uh, uh, logical clifford operations. Here, a uh, magic state can be T-state, Toffley state, Toffley state, and uh, CCD state. Um, I want to uh, mention that um, the pr procedure of preparing this for tolerant magic states uh, also involve a lot of feed forward uh, process selection and may also have the backlog issue. But it's largely separate from the logical computation. So uh, in my talk, uh, I will focus on the feed forward in this uh, logical circuit. 
Um, also, this universality approach based on teleportation is general. Uh, it can be used in concatenated code, uh, topological code, or general non-topological LDPC code. Um, but uh, whichever code you use, uh, this, uh, this RGen, the speed of syndrome generation, supposedly it should increase with the size of the computation. Uh, in our work and in this talk, uh, I will focus on topological code. Uh, specifically, uh, we propose a scheme for um, syndrome processing. Um, and we can make sure that the speed can always keep up with the speed of syndrome generation so that it can avoid this exponential backlog. Uh, we consider topological code because it's more studied than other code. And uh, its error question is uh, relatively simple to formulate because typically it doesn't involve process selection or uh, physical level feed forward. So uh, for our main result, uh, we propose a decoding scheme for topological codes uh, with parallelization in time. Uh, we, call, we call this scheme the sandwich decoding. And here is an illustration of our sandwich decoding for the surface code. On the left is a three-dimensional decoder graph, and the time goes from left to right. The red dots are uh, def defects. And later, I will, uh, I will explain uh, what is a decoder graph and what is defect. Um, our sandwich decoding partition this decoder graph into a sequence of smaller subgraphs along the time direction. Our partition makes sure that these subgraphs do not depend on each other, so they, uh, they can be decoded in parallel. And this is what I mean by uh, parallelization in time. So uh, essentially, uh, the high-level idea of sandwich decoding is divide and conquer. And as a consequence, the decoding throughput R pro uh, is proportional to such parallelism. Here, R pro can be understood as the decoding throughput because they both measure the amount of syndromes processed in a unit time. Uh, and crucially, uh, this parallelism is independent of, of R gen. And that means we can increase this parallelism to make sure that the syndromes are processed as fast as they are generated. And in this sense, our sandwich decoding can uh, resolve the backlog issue for topological codes and teleportation-based universality. Uh, however, this is not enough for, for tolerance because we also have to make sure sandwich decoding has a low logical error rate. And to this end, we extend each subgraph with buffers. Uh, for example, here we depict the buffer region uh, using this uh, transparent regions. And what we really care uh, is, a, is an error correction within this um, blue region. Uh, but, the, the, but the additional syndrome information from the buffer uh, can help us uh, improve the decoding accuracy uh, in the middle. And later I will explain this idea of buffer in detail. And to benchmark the accuracy of sandwich decoding, we simulate the memory, memory experiment for the rotated surface code. Uh, we found that sandwich decoding has almost the same accuracy uh, as offline decoding, provided that we properly choose the buffer region. And here, offline decoding means that uh, you, have the, you have access to all the syndrome information from the whole decoder graph. And this is the best accuracy you can get if you use the same decoding algorithm. And our work is inspired by the overlapping recovery method in the paper by Dennis et al. like uh, 20 uh, years ago. And this method is rediscovered recently by Dash et al. Overlapping recovery also partitions the decoder graph um, along the time direction. And they also use a similar idea to the buffer to maintain the decoding accuracy. So our work basically generalized this idea of overlapping recovery and show that it can be implemented in parallel to solve the backlog issue. Uh, there are also two uh, very relevant papers, and their results are very similar to our sandwich decoding. First is a parallel window decoding 
proposed by Skullrich et al. Their paper was posted on archive on the same day as ours. The second is modular decoding proposed by Bombing et al. And this work uh, was covered uh, by the talk by Sam Roberts this morning. And before I launch into sandwich decoding, uh, I want to first review the typical procedure for error correction of topological codes. So the syndrome extraction circuit for topological codes is usually deterministic and does not involve policy selection or feed forward in the physical level. It consists of Clifford unitaries and polymerements and will uh, periodically generate binary outcomes of this measurement. Throughout this talk, uh, I will look at the example of repetition code, uh, which perhaps is the simplest topological code. Uh, the logical Z operator can be uh, poly Z on any data qubit, uh, Zi. And the logical X operator is transfer, tra uh, transversal X on all the data qubits. And here, uh, this D uh, is the X distance and also equal to the number of data qubits. And on the right is a circuit for, for the memory experiment uh, of repetition code uh, in a logical Z basis. Uh, and time goes from left to right, and we have four cycles of syndrome extraction. And we have uh, one, two, three, four, four data qubits. And they are uh, prepared in the K0 state at the first cycle. And in the last cycle, uh, they are measured in um, uh, Z basis. Okay. An import, uh, important notion is detector, which is certain XR of measurement outcomes. The value of a detector is deterministic in the, press, uh, in the absence of error. And the result loss of generality, we assume this value is always zero. Uh, for example, uh, the XR of these two measurements should be trivial uh, in, the, uh, in the absence of error. And the same is true for any two consecutive uh, outcomes uh, in the same space location. Um, then we can define a decoder graph, uh, which is a hypergraph uh, with vertex set V and edge set E. So uh, each vertex in V corresponds to a detector. And to visualize here, um, uh, we use this square notices, uh, square vertices to denotes all the detectors in the circuit above. For example, uh, this red vertex is a detector containing these two outcomes. And this red, this detector um, contains this single outcome. And this uh, vertex, uh, this, uh, the value of this detector equals to the XR of these three um, outcomes. Then um, if, a decoder, uh, if a detector has a value one instead of zero, then it signals the presence of errors. So we call these non-trivial detectors as defects. For example, uh, an X error before this uh, Z basis measurement uh, will cause these two defects. The observation is that detectors fit by a elementary fault uh, are geometrically local. Uh, this is because uh, the circuit operations for topological codes uh, are typical, uh, typically local. And here, by elementary fault, I mean a set of uh, local poly errors that occur collectively with a non-negligible probability. So with this local property, uh, we can define the edge set E with local hyper edges. So if a fault flips detector set E, then we add this set E as a hyper edge. And here on the right is a complete decoder graph if we consider the standard uh, depolarizing noise model. Uh, we use lines to represent hyper edges. Uh, for example, uh, this X fault will flip these two defects, so we have uh, this red weight two hyper edge. Uh, and on the top and the bottom, um, we use a circle to denote a uh, weight one hyper edge uh, that it contains the enclosed uh, vert vertex. Uh, for example, uh, th this X fault 
before the final measurement uh, will flip this single detector. So we have this bit one hyper edge. As another uh, example, uh, this X fault will flip this uh, diagonal uh, hyper edge of weight two. Uh, notice that uh, different faults may flip the same detectors or the same hyper edge. For example, uh, this hyper edge can be flipped by either a X fault or a Y fault in this location. Okay, uh, now we have defined a uh, decoder graph with vertices V and hyper edges E. Uh, we can then formulate the decoding problem as follows. So first, we have unknown faults F, which is a set of hyper edges. Uh, and the input uh, is a observed defects D of F, which is a set of vertices. And uh, here in this decoder graph, uh, we have three red edges, and they correspond to these three faults in the circuit. So in this case, the set F contains, uh, uh, consists of these three fault edges. And defects D are specified as follows. If a vertex V is incident to an odd number of fault edges, then it's a defect. Otherwise, the value of V is trivial. For example, uh, this detector is flipped by two fault edges, so it's trivial. And these three detectors, uh, they are defects because they are flipped by a single fault edge. So what the decoding does is find corrections K that satisfy uh, defects D. Now here, K is a subset of edges. And by satisfy, I mean a vertex V is a defect, then it should be incident to an odd number of correction edges. And if a vertex is trivial, then it should be incident to an even number of correction edges. Okay, to summarize, the ground truth is fault edges F. The input is defect vertices D of F. And the output is correction edges that satisfy the defects. And by satisfy, I mean a vertex is a defect if and only if it's incident to an odd number of correction edges. And finally, the criteria for success of decoding is that it can guess the correct logical poly frame. For example, if we uh, if we choose the logical Z operator to be poly Z on this third uh, data qubit, then we can consider all the faults that flip the eigenvalue of this logical Z, uh, which is equivalent to a logical X error. And all these faults, they correspond to these uh, red edges in the decoder graph below. And for any fault, if it corresponds to a blue hyper edge, then it doesn't cause a logical error. And typically, your circuit is uh, de uh, designed so that the faults that correspond to the same hyper edge, they have the same logical effect. Okay, so with this property, we can define this uh, calligraphic L to be the set of edges with non-trivial logical effect corresponding to these red edges. So the decoding succeeds if and only if the predicted logical frame a predicted logical effect equals to the ground truth logical effect. Okay, um, so much for the notations. Now we are ready to describe the sandwich decoding. So uh, let's look at this slightly bigger decoder graph of uh, repetition code. Remember that uh, the input is defect vertices and the output is a correction edges that satisfy the defects. So essentially, we have to decide the membership of each hyper edge, whether it uh, belongs to the correction or not. And the, the key idea of sandwich decoding uh, to, uh, to achieve this is divide and conquer. So first, uh, we divide by coloring. Uh, we divide all the vertices uh, into blue and green, uh, two colors. And we uh, divide all the edges into th three colors blue edges, yellow edges, and green edges. And accordingly, we have this uh, blue defects and green defects as an input. Uh, here I didn't show the, the defects. 
uh, and the, the output uh, K uh, is going to be the destroyed union of blue corrections, yellow corrections, and uh, green corrections. And the next step, we divide and conquer by two stages. Uh, in the first stage, we find blue corrections and yellow corrections so that their destroyed unions satisfy all the blue defects. And in the second stage, we find green corrections so that its union with yellow corrections satisfy the green defects. And uh, let's focus on uh, this uh, colorful decoder graph. So uh, while we are in the first stage, uh, we only focus on these blue vertices. So we can ignore all the green vertices and the green edges because they are disjoint from the blue vertices. And while we are in the second stage, um, we only care about the blue de vertices. So uh, we have to respect the membership of yellow edges that are settled in the first stage because yellow edges are adjacent to blue vertices. And, um, uh, and uh, what, is, uh, what is nice with this partition is that uh, in the first stage, uh, we have a sequence of disjoint blue clusters. Um, and for example, this one, and this second one, and this one. So uh, we can, uh, they are disjoint so that we can decode them in parallel. And in the uh, second stage, uh, we have destroyed blue clusters, this one and this one, which can also be decoded in parallel. Um, and uh, uh, I mean, uh, it is precis precisely this independency that uh, increases the decoding throughput. And also remember that time goes from left to right. So uh, we re receive the input detectors cycle by cycle in an online fashion. Um, but we can, um, but, uh, we can uh, start to decode the cluster in the future uh, as long as we um, receive the required detector information. We don't have to wait for the cluster in the past to finish. So the upshot is that uh, the decoding throughput is proportional to such parallelization in time, in the time direction. And to deal with uh, decoding accuracy, we use the idea of buffering. Uh, in our example, uh, when we work on the first cluster of the first stage, uh, our goal is to determine the uh, membership of this uh, blue edges and yellow edges uh, in the core region. But the, input, uh, but the inputs we use consist of not only the detector information in its core, but also from this buffer. Um, so actually, we work on this larger uh, subgraph of the whole decoding graph. Uh, but we only care about the correction edges found in the core region. The rationale for including the buffer uh, is that this additional detector information uh, can improve the accuracy of correction edges in the core region, especially these yellow edges. And similarly, uh, for the next cluster, uh, we actually work on this uh, larger subgraph uh, where the uh, core region is sandwiched between two buffer regions, uh, one buffer in the past uh, and one buffer in the future. And by the way, this is why we call our method the sandwich decoding. Uh, the detector information in these buffers uh, on the side will improve the accuracy of correction edges in the middle. Uh, especially these yellow edges on the boundary. And note that uh, this buffer region overlap with the core region of the first cluster. And also this buffer region overlap with the core region of the second cluster. So these two clusters overlap with each other, but we, we can still decode them in parallel because we only care about the correction edges in the core regions and their respective core regions are destroyed. So there can be no conflict and no dependency. And for this cluster from the second stage, uh, we can start to work on it as, as soon as these yellow edges have been settled. So we don't have to wait for all the clusters in the 
uh, first stage to finish. And here, uh, we don't need buffer for this cluster because we fully trust the, uh, this yellow edges thanks to the buffer uh, used in the first stage. And similarly, uh, we can decode the subsequent clusters in parallel as soon as we receive the required detector information. Uh, or for cluster from the second stage, we can start working on it as soon as the adjacent yellow edges have been settled. Okay, so this is how the sandwich decoding works. And I want to mention that here I'm just using repetition code and the uh, memory experiment as an example. Uh, but the idea of divide and conquer and the buffering can be used for any topological code and uh, any local Clifford circuit. Also, um, uh, I have to emphasize that uh, the specific partition or coloring is not important. Uh, for, exa uh, for example, in this decoder graph, we have three clusters in the first stage and the two clusters from the second stage. This is simply because, you know, I was lazy to draw a bigger decoder graph and a complicated partition. I mean, really, the, uh, for a general um, decoder graph, what is important is the uh, dependency between clusters, whether they are disjoint or uh, adjacent. And also, you want to care about the size of the core regions and the size of the buffer region. You also care about the inner decoder that you decode uh, each cluster, uh, because uh, these are all the factors that are going to influence your uh, decoding accuracy and the decoding throughput. Okay, uh, finally, uh, we have to talk about surface code. Uh, as you can see, uh, this uh, blue, uh, blue color and the three-dimensional cluster are from the first stage. And uh, this green color and the two-dimensional clusters are clusters from the second stage. And uh, we perform circuit-level simulation of memory experiment uh, using the de standard depolarizing noise model. And uh, for the fir uh, first stage cluster like this, uh, we uh, first include the T cycles of detectors uh, in the first buffer, and then uh, T cycles of detectors for the core, and then another T cycle for the second buffer. And here, T equals uh, D plus one over two. And then we use the mean weight perfect matching and the unified decoders as the inner decoder. And uh, uh, we uh, evaluate the threshold for the two inner decoders uh, as these values. And uh, the, uh, the threshold is defined in terms of logical error rate per D cycles. Okay, uh, to summarize, uh, we propose a decoding scheme for topological codes uh, with parallelization in time. Uh, the decoding throughput is proportional to this parallelism and we can increase this parallelism to make sure the decoding throughput uh, is no less than the speed of syndrome generation. Uh, so uh, we can resolve the backlog issue with teleportation-based universality. And to maintain the accuracy of offline decoding, we add buffers to the core cluster that we want to decode. And okay, so for future work, uh, it, it would be interesting to uh, look at decoding throughput for concatenated codes and uh, LDPC code uh, because our work only focuses on uh, topological codes. Also, it would be interesting to study the feed forward for universality approaches uh, that involve physical non clifford gates uh, because our work only considers uh, teleportation based universality. And uh, for transversal non clifford gates, uh, there have already been some works in this direction. Uh, for example, the 3D color code with transversal logical T uh, considered in Bombin's paper. And also, uh, Scrabby et al. studied the uh, 3D uh, surface code with transversal logical CCD gate. And for the uh, non-transversal non-clifford gates, uh, we can look at peaceable fault tolerance or a flag fault tolerance. The challenge uh, with non clifford gates is that uh, the poly frame uh, before the non clifford will become a, a physical clifford frame after the non clifford. And this uh, physical clifford 
may not commute with a subsequent uh, syndrome extraction circuit. Uh, but uh, for teleportation-based universality, life is easier because um, the Clifford frame you have is always a logical frame. Uh, so it always commutes with the syndrome extraction circuit. And finally, uh, most of the threshold theorems and uh, fault tolerance schemes assume classical processing uh, is non-local and uh, instantaneous. So it will be interesting to reevaluate these theorems or schemes under the more realistic assumption of finite speed of classical processing. Uh, for example, uh, we can study the asymptotic space-time overhead or numerical resource estimations for practical algorithms. And uh, with that, I want to thank you for your attention and uh, take questions. Thanks for the very nice talk. So th this sandwich decoder paralyzed in time, and we heard a few other uh, parallel window decoder today. Do they also only split in time, or they can divide also in the spatial dimension? Yeah, yeah, you can. Uh, uh, both our method and uh, the other relevant papers, uh, uh, such as modular decoding, uh, well, this idea can also be um, used to parallelized in the spatial dimension uh, as well as the time dimension. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for a great talk. Uh, there's a, for the for surface code and minimum weight perfect matching, there's an analytical proof on the threshold theorem shown by Fowler, PRL 2012. Uh, this depends on the, to my understanding, this depends on the property of MWPM that finds global minimum or minimum weight in solving product matching. Uh, could this be, could this kind of argument applicable to some, to this kind of parallelizable construction in, in, in by ins even if we insert buffers? So you are referring to the uh, paper by Fowler uh, Proof of finite threshold okay. by matching. Okay, okay. I, I think this uh, uh, this proof based on combinatorics uh, yeah should be uh, applicable to uh, to this um, sandwich decoding. Yeah. Um, okay. In in, in, uh, in in some argument, short so comment is that in, in some argument there, there if they consider arbitrary long logical operators mm -hmm. and then basically use a property of Finding global minimum impact matching, mm -hmm. so I mean, I l l maybe l l let's talk later. Yeah, I think uh, I, I guess my, my feeling is that you, if you uh, want to rigorous proof uh, uh, the existence of a threshold, then you have to be careful about the specific partition and the scheduling. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Thank for coming. My intuition. There's an online question, I can read it. Is there any time analysis result comparing to a conventional approach? Uh, oh, uh, so in our paper, we only benchmarked the decoding accuracy, and uh, we didn't uh, optimize the, uh, uh, you know, the exact decoding time or decoding throughput. Yeah, because that uh, involves a lot of optimization involving the specific hardware, yeah. Yeah, so right, this is not, um, it's been nice to hear all these talks about this decoding and it seems like life's fast enough and everything's good. But there was this paper by um, Poulin and co-authors where they said, maybe you can't figure it out by the time you have to apply a T-gate. So you just apply the T-gate. And then you get this like non-Clifford correction that like bubbles around and then they try to fix it. Um, 
Do you have an opinion on whether uh, these things should be combined, or maybe that was just a bad idea now that we have better decoders? What's your take on that? Oh, you mean the, the paper by Poulon uh, that proposed the, the idea of clear for frame? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm not sure that, uh, yeah, I don't think uh, their theorem can resolve the, the issue for non clear for case. Yeah. Uh, right, because their result is based on a theorem that, uh, you know, any poly frame, uh, any physical, any physical Clifford can be decomposed into the product of a poly times a, a, a logical Clifford. And yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm not sure if that's, this statement uh, applies gener um, for general code, yeah, so. Yeah, thanks. All right, if there's no other questions, let's thank her again.